Welcome to Westminster. We're so glad you're here this morning. Um, today is another special morning. Uh, Meredith is still out of town. She'll be, she got back late last night, so she'll be back in the church tomorrow. But the month of July, we're doing a pulpit takeover where church members are preaching, church members who took the preaching class. And so this morning, we are really blessed to have Kevin Kecker preach for us today. Um, Kevin's been in the church for longer than I know, but he's also been a leader in the church for many years through all different ways of leadership. He even, I, when I preached a few weeks ago and we talked about the, um, how we'd gotten out of debt because of our, our capital campaign, Kevin wasn't here, so I didn't get to stress what he did, but Kevin actually led that whole capital campaign with the preacher switch and everything else going on. So um, Kevin's used his gifts and talents for this church many different times. And this is his first time to ever preach. I thought he had preached before. So I am really excited. Um, Y'all are gonna really enjoy it. I've already gotten to hear it, so that's really fun. Um, So yeah, let's pray. God, thank you so much for this morning. I thank you for just allowing us to be here, for your blessings, for your faithfulness, Lord. We just ask for your Holy Spirit to come. Just be in our midst. Father, help us to forget whatever's going on in our brains that we need to leave at your feet. Father, I pray over Kevin. I pray blessings over him. Lord, I pray that he speaks your words and that your Holy Spirit speaks through him. And Father, I pray that we have open ears and open hearts and open minds to receive all that you want to do in our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord be with you. Please turn to page 302, for Christ the Lord has risen today. may be seated. So this morning, Kevin has a a long passage of scripture that he's going to do a synopsis in his sermon, so I am not going to read that right now. Instead, what we're going to do is go ahead and pass the peace and greet one another, so feel free. If all the children will come forward, Miss Millie's going to give us a great children's message. Hey, Hugo. Just 
the minute. Are you ready for, oh good, we have, oh, this is even more exciting. We have two, two people in children's message. What is your first name? Can you remind me? What is your name? Hi, Ezekiel. I'm Miss Millie. I'm really glad you're here. Hugo and I are glad you're here. So, do you like to vote? We're in America, so you're only going to vote one time, okay? <laughs> Here's what you get to vote on. You ready for this? There's going to be teddy bear number one. There's going to be teddy bear number two, exactly, and teddy bear number three. And what you and Hugo are going to do is you're going to vote on, oh good, Cecil's here too. Yay, we've got three voters today. So what we're going to vote on today is which one do you think looks the most cuddly, okay? So teddy bear number one, raise your hand. Remember, you can only vote once. No, just, who thinks this looks like the most cuddly teddy bear? Hugo, what do you think? Most cuddly, you think? Okay. Does anybody want to vote for this one? Good, thank you. This was mine from 1959. My grandpa gave that one to me. So thank you for voting for him. And then there's this teddy bear, which our little message is going to be more about. You like this one too? Yeah, yeah. So we have three teddy bears. And you're probably wondering, Miss Millie, how does that relate to Jesus? Well, we're going to get there, okay? So Miss Millie took a little road trip this past week. I went to get a dose of history in Vicksburg, Mississippi. And while I was there, I actually saw the place where, are you ready for this? The teddy bear idea came into existence somewhere around Vicksburg, Mississippi. And here's how it all happened. Are you ready for this? See this guy? President of the United States at one time, Theodore Roosevelt. And I need you to say that name. Say Theodore Roosevelt. Now, if you have a name like Theodore, people are probably going to shorten it a bit, maybe down to Ted or to Teddy. His name was Teddy Roosevelt. No, wait, are you hearing a connection? Teddy Bear, Teddy Roosevelt. A coincidence? No. The reason we have teddy bears is because once upon a time, Teddy Roosevelt around Vicksburg, Mississippi, somewhere around that area in general, was out hunting. He had a gun and he was out hunting. But he decided not to shoot one particular bear. He decided, no, I'm not going to shoot that bear. And someone had the bright idea to make a bear kind of like this one. This is one that was given to my son when he was born. It's a homemade bear. And this person said, I'm going to take some material, stuff it, and I'm going to call it a teddy bear. And that's where teddy bears got started, all because this man decided not to shoot a particular bear. So how does that relate to Jesus? Well, here's what happened. I like to know about people's faith journey because in the end, it doesn't matter about all the beautiful stories about their lives. What it all boils down to, my friends, you ready for this? Do they believe, do we believe that Jesus is our Savior? That's all that matters in the end. Do we believe, do these people we read about did they believe that Jesus was their savior? And at this point in time, I'm here to tell you something beautiful about Teddy Roosevelt. When he was a teenager, still in high school, he loved Jesus very, very much. And do you know how he served Jesus? He taught Sunday school. A lot of teenagers go to Sunday school, but this guy as a teenager was actually teaching Sunday school. As a young boy, he was teaching Sunday school. Then he goes off to college goes to a really tough college where he has to study all the time. But guess what Teddy Roosevelt still did? He carved out time to serve Jesus by doing what? Teaching Sunday school, even when he was in college. So the bottom line is, what do we learn from this? Even though we're young, can we still serve Jesus? Yes. Thank you. Perfect. Bingo. That's the answer. Even though we're young, we can serve God by singing, by playing the organ, maybe by collecting and counting the money, maybe by organizing parties, maybe by being a greeter. There are lots of ways, let me repeat, there are lots of ways that even young people can serve God, okay? So let's go to God in prayer. Dear God, when we see teddy bears, help us to remember that we can serve you even when we're very young. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys for being here. This was fun. Please join me on page uh, 462 for Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. You may remain seated. Good morning. I think I know a number of you, but by the way of uh, introduction, my name's Kevin Kecker. Uh, I'm one of those rare creatures. I'm actually a native Houstonian. Uh, I grew up in Houston, uh, went to Westchester High School, which I think is now Westchester Academy. Um, after college, I moved to Dallas, and on a, a work not project, but a relocation, I met my lovely wife, Stephanie, in Evansville, Indiana. Uh, we came back to Dallas to live, and in 2001, we moved back to Houston, and that was the year that we joined this church. So this place has been our church family, our church home for, well, do the math, pretty long time. 
Uh, I'd like to thank Pastor Meredith first for the opportunity to say a few words uh, today, to actually be involved in the pulpit takeover. That's a has kind of a revolutionary kind of sound. I, sur- I assure you, there is really no effort underway to, uh, uh, for any coup opportunities. And uh, for those of you who, uh, who had an opportunity to participate in the six-week sermon series, it was quite an eye-opening experience. Uh, you get a real insight into the thought and into the preparation that goes into a sermon. And you cannot help but be awed and and really admire uh, the quality that we get. And we have an incredibly, I think we all know this, but we have a remarkably gifted pastor in in Meredith. And uh, it's just, it's a pleasure to be here. I would say that I would truly encourage anyone that has an interest in growing their knowledge of scripture um, to take the class if it comes back again. Um, It will help you uh, you'll see scripture in a little different way, uh, not just because you're perhaps preparing for a sermon, but it just opens things up in a, in, a, in a very meaningful way. I will say that if you do take the class, you are not required uh, to, uh, to preach a sermon, at least not in the, in the sanctuary or in Fellowship Hall. But uh, clearly it can happen, so uh, be aware of that as well. Um, You know, life is about discovery. It's about choices. It's about decisions that we make. And sometimes those decisions are very mundane. Uh, For most of us, what we wear in the morning, uh, perhaps what we eat for breakfast, do we have oatmeal or do we have that Texas-sized cinnamon roll that we bought on impulse the day before? Uh, But a lot of the times, the decisions that we make are a bit more Um, substantial. Uh, The question about what you want to do with your life, uh, the values that you develop, the the values that you're looking at in people that you associate with, who is, what things and what people are worthy of your time and your consideration. And then finally, um, taking a look at yourself. Uh, One of those things is how well do I know myself? Uh, what is it that I'm looking for in life? And uh, what are the things that, that other people value in me? And as I get older, I tend to think a little bit more along those lines than I do on some of the questions about breakfast or what I wear. I'd say this, that when I was younger, um, my mother and father were really uh, very resolute about their kids going to church. Uh, having a church family, being, going and attending church was very important to them. And I have to say, we grew up Catholic, um, and it seems like we were at Mass all the time. And uh, we weren't, but it certainly felt like it was. And there was a lot of fish sticks on Friday night. I, rem- I remember that quite vividly. Um, and that actually, I think, looking back on that, my sister and brother and I, Uh, probably didn't have a very good understanding of what was going on. But I think that my parents, it was important to them. They they felt like it was important that we have that experience, that we have exposure to scripture, and that we have exposure to a church family. And looking back on that, I've got a real appreciation for what they did. Those of you with children or those of you who have raised kids, uh, you know, it can't be easy. Uh, There were countless arguments in the morning, no doubt about, and reasons why you can't go to church. My parents suffered, went through all of that, and yet, um, even though we weren't particularly plugged in to the faith at that age, it was something that we continued on until, and really until our uh, mid-teenage years for, for my brother and my sister and myself. There are two particular church experiences that come to my mind. One of them is is about being in church and the other is surrounding church. Uh, The the one about being in church, I think I was seven, maybe eight years old. Uh, My sister and I were attending a catechism, a series of catechism classes during the summer. And at the end of each day or at the end of each morning, all the kids would collect in the sanctuary uh, with all of the teachers 
that were there. It was a pretty hectic time. Our, our parish priest was Father Ray. Father Ray was a very imposing man, at least to, to small kids. He, had a, uh, he wore these black robes, and he had this powerful, booming voice that required little to no amplification. We were sitting in, in Mass that day, and I remember he was reading the homily, and this little girl, this poor little girl, chooses that time to get up and, and, and head toward the restroom. So she makes her way across the aisle, across the pew, and then down the main aisle toward the restrooms. Father Ray stopped in mid-sentence, and he pointed his finger at this little girl, and he commanded her to return to her, to her pew. I was afraid to look because I could have, I knew for sure that she had been reduced to a pillar of stone or salt uh, or maybe eviscerated. I wasn't sure, but I didn't think it was going to be a particularly pleasant experience. But she survived and she made her way back to the pew and uh, Father Ray continued on and, and completed, completed the service. To, my, to really to this day, my sister and I, we've talked about this, we're really not sure whatever happened to that little girl. Don't really know what happened to the teacher who permitted her to go that day. But uh, I have to think that that was a, a, a very changing experience for both of them. Um, we really thought, kids in that, in, in that parish thought Father Ray was God. The, fire and brimstone type of, uh, of God that you read about in the Old Testament. My second memory was as a young teenager. We had just moved back uh, to the, or moved to the west side of Houston in a community called Nottingham Forest. Um, we lived in a community that had a neighborhood ch uh, church, a uh, Catholic church, and we could often walk on Sundays to service. My parents wanted to walk to service. And so they gather up the kids and off we go. Now my father was an, was an audiophile. He, he loved electronics, he loved music, and he particularly loved big band music. And he also loved to whistle. And so we would head out toward church, walking down the street, and I lived in mortal fear that my dad would be in full regale doing Gigi, something that Benny Goodman had done, and at the top of his whistle uh, would, would, would continue on as we, as, as we walked. I was very concerned that I'd run into a friend, or maybe worse, a girl that I liked, and it would just embarrass the living bejeebers out of me, right? So I concocted this tactic, if you will. I decided that what I would do is I would engage him in conversation. I figured he couldn't whistle and talk at the same time, right? Although my dad sometimes surprised me, and he, and, he, and he actually did one or two times. How he pulled that off, I don't really know. Nothing happened with that, but as a, as a kind of a, as a note to, to end on with that story, uh, St. John Vianney was the same church 15 years later that Stephanie and I got married in. So... Uh, Fast forward to um, my mid-30s, I was, had a medical ex uh, experience, if you will, uh, had a diagnosis that wasn't uh, particularly attractive, and uh, one of the things that I remember about my earlier church experience was um, I really loved the stories about Jesus. And I had made a decision, I promised myself that one day, one day I would take the time to read the Bible from end to end. Um, cancer has a way of kind of focusing your, your, uh, your energies pretty well. And I figured that if I was going to do it, this was probably the time to do it. And I think probably Stephanie and I were both in sort of this middle ground spiritually. Um, as I said, I really hadn't been uh, active in the church or really in the faith really since the teenage years. But we decided that we wanted to find a church family. We found a wonderful church in Dallas. And we ended up um, signing up for an eight-month study, Bible study, 
that was interactive. It's called Disciple Bible Study. And we sat for eight months. We would meet on Thursday evenings and we would discuss the Bible passages that we read. And we did that with other, other novice believers as we were. And I have to say that um, many years back, that, that decision changed my life in, in some very profound ways. Uh, another decision I'd like to talk about, and it's tied to the scripture passage we're gonna, we're gonna cover, the, uh, the death and the resurrection of Lazarus, a decision that was made by a woman in the story, uh, Martha. Uh, her decision was, was very profound, and it really had very uh, certainly cosmological consequences to it. Before I get into that, I do want to take just a, a, a quick aside, and I want to touch on just a couple of things regarding the, the art of, not maybe the art, but the, the idea of um, uh, the profound aspect of discovery. There are three things that I have discovered through the, the past 25, 30 years um, that I'd like to share with you. I recognize that people process the word different, and there are people sometimes that if I, if I mention some things that, that touch you and help you in your walk with the Lord, that's outstanding, that's wonderful. If it doesn't appeal to you, just discard it. There are so many good resources out there in addition to the Bible that will help you in your walk with Christ. And I have no doubt that Meredith and Casey will be more than happy to kind of point you in the right direction if you're so inclined. The, the first discovery, I think, is the role of history. You know, if you think about it, Jesus was a real man. He lived in a, in a historical period, and there were things that were happening in that, in, during that time frame. It's also very important, I think, for me it was important, to understand a little bit about Jewish history, to know a little bit about the, the destruction of the first temple in the sixth century BC, and then to, to know a little bit about the, how profound the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem was in, in 70 AD. There's so many things that, that work off of that. And if you understand that, it kind of helps you give, give a perspective to things. I found that to be very important. Um, another is that the gospel writers, many people already knew this, it, 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 it escaped my radar for a number of years, but the gospel writers had really specific audiences in mind with the people that they were, that they were trying to communicate with. One is, you think, for example, about the gospel of Matthew. Matthew is clearly written for someone that was conversant with the Jewish faith. They knew Torah, they would know the, the, the story of Daniel, they knew I, the book of Isaiah. There are so many references in there that tie Jesus' Jewishness, if you, if you will, to his role as the Messiah. And there's some fascinating connections. I think that, that if, if you can put some of those things together that really uh, provide uh, color and, and perhaps even additional meaning to scripture when you read it. The other, we know, for example, Luke, the Gospel of Luke is written principally for Gentiles, for people that, 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 that emphasizes the humanity of Jesus. Um, Luke, for example, has two of the most beautiful parables that only exist in Luke. Uh, the prodigal son is one of them, and um, also the, the Good Samaritan. Those are, those are stories unique to Luke that talk about Jesus and God in a way that I think help people perhaps that were not of the Jewish tradition understand that better. And then finally, and this will tie back to our scripture passage that I'll get to in just a moment, I promise, uh, is the role of symbolism. Um, words mean, words and numbers oftentimes mean more than just what is represented. Uh, you see, for example, the number 12, the number 40, the number three, the number seven, six. Uh, six is more than five plus one. Uh, the number 12, uh, you notice that when certain things happen, the number 12 is used. The number 40 is often used to not just indicate a numerical uh, representation, but to tell you that something is being completed. 
there are, there are hints along the way with some of the symbolism. And it's very, I have found that just in my own study of scripture as a novice Christian, like everyone, uh, most people are, that that's helped me. And uh, I hope that will help you as well. This all leads to our scripture passage, which is uh, in the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verses 1 through 45. It's a story that I think everyone is, most people are familiar with. Um, but what I'd like to do, rather than to read all 45 lines of it, is just try to give you a, a quick uh, summary of what's taking place in the scripture. Uh, to begin with, Jesus and the disciples have just come back from Jerusalem. They uh, were preaching in Jerusalem, and as is uh, Jesus want, I suppose, he would oftentimes say things that, uh, how to say, incited um, uh, the, the Jewish hierarchy. And he said something in particular that bothered them, where they again started reaching for stones to throw at him. And uh, he said that he and the Father were one which the Jews saw in their, in their thinking that that was blasphemy. And of course, Jesus, as he begins to explain what that means, he, he uh, uh, dissuades them from that thinking, although I don't know that he necessarily convinced them. But they left. They crossed the River Jordan, and they went to a community where John the Baptist used to, to preach. Now, John the Baptist, of course, has been, is, has been gone by this time. But this is where Jesus gets word from Mary and Martha that Lazarus is very sick. And what's curious about this is, is that Jesus truly, and scripture says this, loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And yet he didn't immediately turn to go and address the, the issue, to, to approach uh, Bethany where Lazarus was and try to heal him. He purposely waited two days. He stayed in place for two days. It's very enigmatic, uh, or it seems to be very puzzling. And he goes on to tell his disciples that uh, Lazarus is sleeping and that uh, what is going to take place is going to be uh, for the glory of the sun. And eventually the disciples understand as Jesus tells them, look, <laughs> Lazarus is not sleeping, he's dead. And that's when they leave to go, uh, to go see him. So along the way, Jesus encounters Martha. You remember Martha and Mary were mentioned in, in earlier scripture. Martha and Mary were the ones that had hosted uh, I suspect Lazarus was in, was in the home as well, but they had hosted Jesus and the disciples before. They were very good friends. Martha was the one who worked real hard, and Mary was the one who sat and watched and listened to Jesus. You may remember that Jesus uh, very softly reprimands Martha when she complains that she's not getting any help in the kitchen. And uh, uh, Jesus tells Martha that she that her sister Mary had actually chosen, I think, the right thing or the correct choice. But back to the story, Jesus encounters Martha, and she says something to him that just had to cut him to the quick. She says to him, Lord, if you had been here, Lazarus, my brother, would not have died. And I'm going to read just a couple of passage here, passages here because I think this is the part where Meredith had always to, had told us during the class, he said, you know, you're going to find that there's, as you're preparing a sermon, you're going to find that there's a, a nugget, uh, a real core to the story that you want to try to build your, your, your discussion or sermon about. And to me, this is, this is truly it. In John 11, 23, 27, Jesus tells Martha that your brother will rise again. She replies, I know he will rise again on the resurrection on the last day. Jesus responds, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes will never die. And here's the question. Do you believe this? Martha responds, yes, Lord, I believe that you're the son of God, the one coming into the world. So think about that for a second. Scripture is, is, doesn't 
give us any inclination, it doesn't give us any insight, I think, into uh, intonation, the tone. Uh, when she says that to him, was she angry? Was she disappointed? Was she grief stricken? She probably was all things. And yet, and yet, in the face of such grief, in the face of such disappointment, Martha believes. She believes. She then leaves. She goes back to uh, her home and she, uh, where Mary is, she tells Mary the rabbi is coming. Mary gets up and she meets Jesus. She falls at his feet. <laughs> she says the same thing. Lord, if you'd been here, my brother Lazarus, whom you love, would still be alive. And then something really very unique happens. Mary starts to cry. The mourners start to cry. And Jesus asks her, he said, Scripture says that he's disturbed. Jesus asks her where, where Lazarus is, and she shows him or points him to the tomb, on the way to the tomb. And then Jesus, Jesus weeps. Shortest two lines, I think, in the New, in the, in, certainly in the New Testament. Jesus weeps. Think about that a second. What kind of God weeps? What kind of God bleeds? What kind of God has experienced the sorrow, the ups and downs, the joys of life, the same way that we have? You know, Jesus clearly had witnessed heartache in his life. I, Every, if you've read much history, you know the Roman Empire was a pretty brutal time to live through. I think during that time, uh, life was very cheap. But Jesus, the, the, the Bible is very uh, silent with respect to, for example, what happened to Joseph, his earthly father. Surely he, mo he mourned his loss. He also recently lost his, his cousin, John the Baptist, who had been executed earlier. Jesus knew grief. He knew about it. Jesus lived the human condition. I think in that moment, the loss of another friend, the suffering of those around him brought him to tears. Jesus wept. So we know the last part of the story. Jesus goes on to the tomb. Um, he instructs the men around him to remove the stone from the tomb. And Martha says, well, you know, uh, Lord, uh, he's been in that tomb for four days, so it's going to smell pretty bad. So it's very clear that, that uh, Lazarus is dead. He's also there for four days, not three. That's kind of tying back to some of the number piece I'd mentioned earlier. So he calls Lazarus to come out. And miraculously, Lazarus comes out. He's got the, the, the burial uh, wrappings around him. Jesus instructs the people around him to unbind him and let him go. Scripture also says that, this is, this is an interesting uh, statement, I thought. It says, and those that saw what he had done believed in him. Those that saw what he had done had believed in him. So what are we to do with this? How do we, what do we make of this story today? Um, how should we respond? For me, I think that, that Martha's confession of faith uh, to Jesus very early in the scripture, while in the grips of sorrow and disappointment over the loss of her brother, is the stance that, that I should take as well. We can find hope in all of life's circumstances by choosing to trust in Jesus and being confident that the power that raised Jesus from the dead and the power that raised Lazarus from the dead is the same power that will, will raise us and all those who believe in him. Um, I'd like to close with a short passage from one of my favorite authors, uh, arguably the probably the leading um, um, apologist, Christian apologist in the 20th century, C.S. Lewis. This is from his just staggeringly good 
uh, book, Mere Christianity, Lewis says, <clears throat> I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. Lewis says that is the one thing we must not say. A man who is merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Let me close in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for the countless gifts that you bestow upon us each day and for the sacrifice of your Son and Savior, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, strengthen our belief during both the joyful and the difficult seasons of life, never losing sight of that miraculous light of hope which is offered to each of us. Belief is more than a feeling or an emotion. It is a conscious decision we make each day. May we choose to believe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. If you would join me in reciting the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Kevin. We really appreciate all that you had to share with us. This has been such a fun time. I hope you'll continue to come to these. We have them for the next two weeks um, to hear our church members uh, just share their hearts. Uh, this is a time in the service that we call the offering. Um, it's been a while since we passed offering plates. We don't really do that anymore. If you'd like to give a donation, you can put it in the clear box in the back. But what we do during this time is we really focus in on just being in God's presence. So we'll have about two or three minutes of music, and we encourage you to ask the Lord what it looks like for you to give yourself as an offering to him this week with your gifts, your talents, your service, everything that is you, and just enjoy some time in God's presence when it's quiet for just a few minutes. We have our altar up here that you're welcome to come up and pray if you like. Please stand for the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Please turn in your hymnal to page 95, I mean 98, to God be the glory. may be seated. I just have a few announcements, um, quite a few actually. Uh, Millie is having a mission project with her older kids called Soul Hope. They are going to cut out um, footprints on blue jeans and then this ministry makes shoes for children who don't have shoes. So if you have blue jeans you want to donate, you can give those to Millie. Um, CCSC is, is back into having their back to school uh, service opportunity. If you would like to volunteer, that's in your bulletin. You can volunteer with CCSC to help put all of that together. But also, if you'd like to give financially for a backpack, it's $75, and a child will get everything they need to go to school. Um, If you do do that, you can um, give online. Just put in the memo or on your check or on the envelope. Just put in the memo that it's for CCSC back to school. Um, we have a new West, new to Westminster um, luncheon on August 6th. It's actually kind of a brunch. It's between services. But if you've been going to Westminster for a while and or just started coming and you want to learn more about Westminster, this is a great place to be. Um, also, if you're a person who doesn't like to come up to the front to join a church, um, this is also a great thing because you can do that in, the, in a very small group. You can join the church at that, at that brunch. Um, 
Another thing that we have coming up on August 10th, last month we had a really fun mix and mingle at the Lundstrom's house for adults. And in August, on August 10th, we're going to have a really fun night at the Kelly's. It's an astro theme night for adults. So I'd love for you to sign up, come. It's a lot of fun. We had a lot of people who are new to the church, and that was a great opportunity to get to know people. So hopefully you can come to that. Um, one that is near and dear to my heart is we have Pumpkin Patch Leadership sign up right now. Um, it seems crazy that we are talking about pumpkins in July, but it is not crazy because um, it takes a lot of leaders, people working to make that happen. Um, I will give a shout out to the men in the church. They've already gone and gotten all of these pallets that you see on the front lawn. I think we have all the pallets we need already. Um, Bruce organized the men. They made many different trips. Um, so I am very grateful for the people who are already stepping up. But if you have any desire at all to help with the pumpkin patch, please get on and look at the leadership opportunities. Um, just a heads up, the blessings of, blessing of the backpacks is August 20th, so if you have a child or you're a teacher, we'd love to bless your backpack. And then our juice box challenge that we've done the last three summers is coming to an end on July 31st. So if you haven't given juice boxes or want to give some more, um, this is for Kids Meals Ministry. They feed children throughout the summer and throughout the year when kids don't have food. Um, you can donate through their website, um, through a link that's in the bulletin, and it goes straight to them. Or you can go buy 100% juice boxes, drop them off at the church, and I'll make sure that they get them. So please stand for our benediction. Go now, knowing that you serve a God who heals, a God who loves you, and a God who wants to be with you, and wants you to show him to other people. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.